Welcome to Bayes' Theorem. This is a video lesson for probability and statistics. Bayes' Theorem is a tool we will develop in order to aid in inverting conditional probabilities so that we might make certain kinds of inferences from data. Before introducing Bayes' Theorem, we'll revisit an example in which we explore the pitfalls of implementing a universal screening test for a rare disease within a large population so that we might illustrate the kinds of situations that give rise to its application. Earlier, we investigated the relationship between the events S and D. These were the events that a person actually has a rare and debilitating syndrome and the event that they are diagnosed with it. We knew the probabilities of a correct diagnosis. These were D give, probability of D given S equals 0.9937 and the probability of D complement given S complement equals 0.9912 and they represented the probabilities of the test producing a true positive or a true negative result. We imagined the universal administration of this test to a large population and then summarized its expected results with a contingency table. To summarize, the rows of this table divided the population into people who actually had the syndrome and did not, and the columns divided the same population into people who were diagnosed as having the syndrome and those who were not. We used this table to compute the probabilities of observing type 1 and type 2 errors. These were the probability of D given S complement, or the probability of being diagnosed with the disease when you were in fact healthy and the probability of D complement given S, or the probability of being diagnosed as healthy when you in fact have the disease. Both the type 1 and type 2 error rates were relatively small in the sense of probabilities. However, when we used the type 1 error probability to estimate the expected number of type 1 errors we would incur in the healthy population, we saw that we would unacceptably misclassify over 1.6 million healthy people as sick. Another way to see and understand this problem is to ask different questions. We might ask, what is the probability you are actually sick if you obtain a diagnosis that says you are sick, or P of S given D? You could also ask, what is the probability you are actually not sick if you obtain a diagnosis that says you are sick, or P of S complement given D? We could ask, what is the probability you are actually sick if you obtain a diagnosis that says you are not sick? Finally, we can ask, what is the probability you are actually not sick if you obtain a diagnosis that says you are not sick, or P of S complement given D complement? All four of these questions are really getting at the heart of the same issue. They're asking, how reliably can a diagnosis predict your actual health? In our current example, of course, we could just answer all four of those questions by computing the related conditional probabilities using our contingency table. In doing so, you would find the probability that you are sick if you had a diagnosis of being sick, or P of S given D, to be 929 over 1,646,416, or 0 0.0005643. Similarly, the probability of you not being sick given that you've been diagnosed as sick is pretty close to 1. It's 1,645,487 divided by 1,646,416, or 0 0.9994357. On the other hand, the probability that you are sick given a healthy diagnosis, or P of S given D complement, is just 6 over 185 million three hundred and forty one thousand six hundred ninety three which comes out to be about three point two three seven times ten to the negative eight a low probability likewise the probability that you are not sick if you are given a diagnosis of being not sick is reassuringly close to one it's one hundred eighty five million three hundred and forty one thousand six hundred eighty seven divided by one hundred eighty five million three hundred and forty one thousand six hundred and ninety three and this is um, overwhelmingly close to 1 at 0 0.9999999676. The first two probabilities, P of S given D and P of S complement given D, 
which are complements of each other, should be a major source of concern. They tell us that if we apply a universal screening program with the diagnostic test, the probability that you are actually sick if you receive a diagnosis of being sick is quite low. Conversely, the probability that you are not sick, given that your diagnosis says you are, is quite high. In other words, you are far more likely to be healthy than sick if you have a diagnosis that says you are sick. Under this particular example where we're applying universal screening for a rare disease to a large population. These probabilities are the inverses of P of D given S and P of D given S complement, which just represent the true positive diagnosis and the type 1 error rate. It should be clear that they carry very useful information. In this case, they could have told us that if you apply a universal testing program for a rare disease to a large population, people who receive a diagnosis that says they are sick are far more likely to be healthy than sick. Well, this begs the question, can we compute these inverse probabilities without going to the trouble of forming a contingency table? It turns out that there is a technique for inverting conditional probabilities, and we're going to develop that technique through an example before formally stating it as a theorem. So imagine that we have a service manager at a car dealership who is analyzing customers' maintenance behavior. Let's let M represent the event of maintenance occurring at least once every 5,000 miles. We'll let B represent the event of a major breakdown during the car's 35,000 mile warranty period. It is reasonable to believe that one could estimate the probability that a car that has been maintained once every 5,000 miles is a car that will suffer a major breakdown during its 35,000 mile warranty period. This probability would be P of B given M. In order to estimate P of B given M, the dealership service center keeps track of all the cars that it services at least once every 5,000 miles. Let's assume there were 270 such cars. Out of all of these cars, the service center records show that 23 of them suffered a major breakdown during their 35,000 mile warranty period. Therefore, the probability in question is P of B given M equals 23 over 270. Now suppose a member of the dealership's marketing department has a reason for needing to know the inverse of this probability. In other words, they want to know the probability of M given B rather than the probability of B given M. In other words, she wishes to know the probability that a car that has broken down was brought in for regular maintenance. She could always revert to the definition of conditional probability and try to determine P of M given B by forming the probability of M intersect B over P of B. However, it's possible this is impractical. Perhaps she does not have direct knowledge of P of M intersect B, or she simply doesn't wish to calculate it. In fact, she might not even have a direct measurement of P of B, but we'll get to that later. She remembers that P of B given M is also expressed in terms of P of M intersect B. And by symmetry, P of M intersect B also equals P of B intersect M. So she writes down P of B given M equals P of B intersect M over P of M. Therefore, she has two equations that both involve P of B intersect M. She can solve both of them algebraically for P of B intersect M and then equate them to one another. This forms one equation in which P of B intersect M has been totally eliminated. This equation is P of M given B times P of B equals P of B given M times P of M. She then rewrites this new equation so that she has explicitly solved for P of M given B. And that turns out to tell her P of M given B equals P of B given M times P of M divided by P of B. Now for her to be able to use this equation, she does need estimates for P of M and P of B, the probabilities that any given car is maintained regularly and that any given car breaks down within 35,000 miles. 
For now, we'll just assume that she is able to obtain this information from consumer advocacy groups, automobile organizations, etc. So for now, assume that P of M equals 0 0.85 and P of B equals 0 0.17. This, together with the formula she's developed, allows her to invert the conditional probability P of B given M. So P of M given B equals P of B given M times P of M divided by P of B, or 23 over 270 times 0.85 divided by 0.17. And this calculates to 0 0.4259. Thus, if a car shows up at the dealership with a major breakdown that occurs within the warranty period, it is only 42.59% likely that the car was regularly maintained. Our maintenance example made use of a very powerful technique for inverting conditional probabilities known as Bayes' theorem. It is believed that this theorem first appeared in an essay written by the Reverend Thomas Bayes. The essay was later revised and published by his friend Richard Price. We'll state and prove this theorem now. So Bayes' theorem tells us that if A and B are two events from the same sample space, then the probability of B given A equals the probability of A given B times p of b divided by the probability of a. The proof of Bayes' theorem relies really only on algebra, and it mirrors what the car dealership employee did to derive her formula, but we'll review it here. We observe that the definition of conditional probability, and more importantly, the general multiplication formula, tells us that the probability of a intersect b equals the probability of a given b times p of b and the probability of B intersect A equals the probability of B given A times P of A. But since the probability of A intersect B equals the probability of B intersect A through symmetry, then we can equate the probability of B given A times the probability of A to the probability of A given B times the probability of B. And then all we have to do is solve that equation for probability of B given A by dividing both sides by the probability of A. This results in Bayes' formula, which states the probability of B given A equals the probability of A given B times the probability of B divided by the probability of A. The different components of the Bayes' formula have names that hint at the typical applications of the theorem. Imagine B to be an event whose probability we wish to know, while A represents the event that we gather data or evidence that qualifies B. P of B is called the prior probability. When using Bayes' theorem to make inferences about the probability of an event from data, the prior probability represents the opinion we hold about how likely B is before we've gathered any data about B. P of A given B is called the likelihood. If we fix our evidence, A, but sweep over all possibilities for B, it is a measure of likelihood in the sense that it should be higher if the evidence is supportive of B and lower if it isn't. P of A is called the marginal probability of A. We compute it by marginalizing A relative to all possibilities of B. And finally, P of B given A is called the posterior probability of B. It represents the informed probability that B will occur or is true once we've gathered data or evidence in the form of A. Bayes' theorem provides a framework for how our subjective perceptions about the prior probability of an event can evolve once we perform experiments, collect data, gather evidence, or do anything else that provides us information about the event. Bayes' theorem can be used to help us learn from evidence or data. We'll illustrate this framework by revisiting our car maintenance example. In order to invert the probability P of B given M equals 23 over 270 and compute P of M given B, the marketing representative needed to know both P of B and P of M as well. She might be able to subjectively estimate the value of the prior probability P of M equals 0 0.85 by looking at her own service records. P of B, or the marginal probability, might not be as directly measurable. Breakdowns might not be reported to the dealer. A customer might just cut his losses and sell the car. We'll compute P of B indirectly by marginalizing over M using the law of total probability. 
probability of B equals the probability of B given M times the probability of M plus the probability of B given M complement times the probability of M complement. The probability of B given M complement, or the probability that a car that has not been maintained regularly will suffer a breakdown, is still unknown. This could be estimated using data from advocacy groups or automotive clubs. Assume the probability of B given M complement equals 0 0.6506. If we put this information together, we find the probability of M given B equals the probability of B given M times the probability of M divided by the probability of B. However, because of the law of total probability, the denominator in the right-hand side of our formula may be rewritten as the probability of B given M times the probability of M plus the probability of B given M complement times the probability of M complement. We have values, or at least estimates, for all of the probabilities on the right-hand side, so we can substitute them into our formula. This results in the correct value of 0 0.4259 for the probability of M given B. So we've reproduced the value for P of M given B that we found earlier, but we were able to do so without requiring direct knowledge of P of B. We'll consider one more example in which we seek to determine which one of three competing possibilities is the most probable in the face of evidence that we gather. We know that the prior probabilities that a student will go to a prestigious college on the East Coast, the West Coast, or to some other college are P of E equals 0.18, P of W equals 0.14, and P of O equals 0.68 respectively. Suppose we know that the probability that a student who goes to a prestigious college on the East Coast is able to enter a successful law career is P of L given E equals 0.42. Similarly, the probability that a student who goes to a prestigious college on the West Coast is able to enter a successful law career is P of L given W equals 0.37. And finally, the probability that a student who goes to any other college is able to enter a successful law career is only P of L given O equals 0 0.13. Remember, our end goal is to determine that if we were to encounter someone who had entered a successful law career, how likely would it be that they had attended a prestigious college on the East Coast or the West Coast or some other university? To make this determination, we need to know the probability of E given L. So we may begin with Bayes' theorem. The probability of E given L equals the probability of L given E times P of E divided by P of L. However, since we don't know the marginal probability, P of L, directly, we should also appeal to the law of total probability. P of L equals P of L given E times P of E plus P of L given W times P of W plus P of L given O times P of O. And if we substitute all of our known data into this formula, we'll arrive at a value of 0 0.2158 for P of L. In turn, we can now use Bayes' theorem to compute P of E given L. P of E given L equals P of L given E times P of E divided by P of L. And now we substitute our known values into that formula and compute in order to obtain a value of 0 0.3503. So it is just over 35% likely that if we encounter someone who has entered a successful law career, they had attended a prestigious university on the East Coast. Similarly, we need to compute the probability of W given L. Using Bayes' theorem, that will be the probability of L given W times P of W divided by P of L and again, if we substitute our known data into that formula, we'll obtain a value of 0 0.24. And finally, the probability of O given L equals the probability of L given O times the probability of O over the probability of L. If we substitute our known data into that formula, we'll obtain a value of 0 0.4096. Therefore, in the face of the evidence that a person has a successful law career, we can now say that the posterior probabilities that they attended a university on the East Coast, 
West Coast, or somewhere else are approximately 35%, 24%, and 41% respectively. We conclude, or really infer, that it is most likely that the lawyer attended a university somewhere other than the East or West Coasts. With that, we've reached the end of our video lesson on Bayes' theorem. Hopefully you found it helpful. Thank you for watching, and please join us as we move to our next video lesson where we introduce probability distributions and random variables.